introduce? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sabina Stefan, and I'm a second year PhD student at Brown. And it is my pleasure today to introduce this panel. Um, we have Michelle bach Kobeli, as well as Professor Ian Del Antonio. And we'll be discussing internal and external spaces. Um, we're very, very pleased to have them here. Um, <clears throat> So Michelle bach is a performance artist and educator who since coming to Brown in 1987 has created over 40 original pieces of contemporary movement theater for the, um, that investigates socio-political canvases, cross-cultural narratives, and embodied texts. At Brown University, she directs New Works, World Traditions, a research to performance troupe of actors, musicians, dancers, and imagists who develop new theater for national and international festivals, educational venues, and for the concert stage. And Professor Delant Jan, Jan Delantonio um, is a physics professor at Brown and studies the distribution of dark matter in the universe by measuring the distortions mass caused to the shape of space. He uses some of the largest telescopes in the world to take images of millions of distant galaxies that lie behind the dark matter. By studying how these images are altered, Prof. Del Antonio and his group can measure both the amount as well as the shape of, these of the dark matter. The patterns of galaxy shapes reveal that dark matter is not uniformly distributed but instead organized into irregular clumps and subclumps, reflecting the formation history of the structures via gravitational accretion. So in today's panel, uh, we hope to have an informal discussion between the two. Um, I hope to do very little guiding, only if necessary. Um, but to start off the panel, I'll ask you both, what is space and what is it not? <laughs> Um, we were very fortunate to have an opportunity to meet at the coffee exchange um, and to have a very, very um, vivacious discussion about this topic. So um, at any time, we, we, we kept um, igniting new conversations, inspiring new ways of looking at these. Um, as a choreographer and a dancer, my body is my PowerPoint, my body is that space, it's my canvas, the colors, the text, um, the poetry, because a dancer spends all of their time living in dynamic, energetic space. This is our job. We look interiors, we look at our disciplined interiorities, look at the architectural um, vibrancy of this body and how to take that energetic space from the interiorities and how to move it out, how to dynamically affect other bodies. So our job is to provoke a dynamic, energetic conversation. Um, and so when we, you know, I love this thing, interior space, that's sort of where I live. Um, and what many of my practices have been about, about truly understanding the congruence and the confluence and the dynamic, um, how should I say it? All the words that, um, I love the Miles Davis quote, because that's what a dancer does. A dancer listens deeply to those silences, those spaces in between, to know where to go next. Um, and in this art form, um, we connect with other beings unknowingly. So one of the practices, and this was one thing that got us both um, jumping out off of our chairs, uh, we were both like, oh, um, is how the space that I move through affects someone else. Uh, one of the practices is called authentic movement, where everyone closes their eyes 
and we breathe deeply, um, going from conscious world, conscious space, to unconscious space, and to begin to listen deeply to those interior spaces, and just to follow, to follow those spaces, and truly affecting other people who cannot see but who feel the energetic exchange, who feel what I'm doing if I did this, somebody across the room would feel that. So this dynamic, this alive, this energetic space is what we train in. Um, are you excited to jump in there yet? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, one of the key aspects, and, and Professor Alexander pointed this out, the conception of gravity that Einstein gave us is that, that space is not a stage. Uh, and not a static stage. It is a stage that responds to actors. And this linkage between matter creating the curvature of space and then the space responding, the matter responding to the curvature of space. So that in the work I do, which is gravitational lensing, and, and Stefan showed a couple of the photographs that I also wanted to show, <laughs> stealing my thunder. Um, it, it is clearly a situation where the, there's this linkage where as matter moves, it distorts the space and the other objects respond to that distortion. So for example, one of the, the classic uh, pictures that uh, relativity puts in our heads is that, um, for example, the Earth going around the sun is no longer thought of as the Earth's uh, tied to some invisible string to the sun. It's that the sun warps the space around the Earth and tells the Earth how to move. So that there's this classic quote that gravity bends space and then sp space tells matter how to move. That linkage connects everything because as I move, I warp the space around me. That space warping then ripples off and affects everything else. It is to be said that part of the reason why I study galaxies and galaxy clusters and massive things is that that linkage is not very strong. And so me moving creates a very, very, very small ripple. And part of the reason why the great discovery that uh, was made about gravitational waves involved black holes moving close to, the speed, close to the speed of light is the way to make that ripple large is you know, to throw a large rock into the pond rather than a small pebble. And the, the bigger the rock, the easier it is to measure. And similarly, with the curvature of space, the more the mass, the more the space is bent, the easier it is to see the galaxies bent around the space. But the same principle applies, that it's, it's this thing that interconnects everyone, and everyone responds to the same space that links performance and physics. So one of the things that we do in creating, I'm gonna call it theater, dance theater, is, I mean, it's hard for me to sit down, right? I'm kind of, <laughs> but one of the things that, you can hear me, yes? One of the things that's really important is I would like for you to see the music, right? I want you to see the music and then hear the dance, right? Okay, did you see the music? Through shifting qualitative preferences, right? Affinities, quick in time. Uh, indirect in space. One of the things that one of my master teachers taught me, Ermgard Barteniev, who is a uh, Rudolf Laban, um, uh, I would say protege, she was saying, no, space is about how you attend to it. So one of the things that we would do is we would indirectly, we would attend to space with multi-focus. Right? I would not in. And then you go like that. And the difference between those things, right, gives us qualitative. That is what creates the music. And also those spaces in between, right, you can hear the resonation. You can feel it resonating. You can feel it, the ripple effect. Um, so um, one of the most important things is how we attend to space as a dancer. And how we design space. How we create the tension, right? I can I can make this space very tense, right? That's how I'm a tension. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's <amazing. laughs> but it's true. It's how I attend 
into it. Um, how I can emotionally, like motion causes motion. I know that there's all kinds of great science behind that one. Um, but it's true, like my motion would create emotion in someone next to me. And they would come back and without it, you know, it's not a pre-planned event. It's an event that's instantaneous, part of my physiognomy, part of what I've been training for me to be able to pull these things out and to be affected by it. So motion causes motion, then motion causes emotion. Emotion causes motion. So we're in this incredible um, triptych of action-reaction, cause-effect, one thing leading to the next. And I would say that's how dances get made because they come from a very deep interior need to not only express but to be in space with other people. Um, so a dancer would also, if I'm going to say how we look at space, um, I mean it's, it's infinite actually, but like this space right here. All right. So if I'm going to choreograph something where I really want you to pay attention, I really want you to get this, I would move from up left to down right diagonals, knowing that there's this emotion that happens when I'm moving down this diagonal. Where this space over here, not so important. All right, but moving this way, coming right up to you all, this is intimate space. This is where vaudeville, this is where you know, all the jokes happen. This is where you, you and I are like, right? you are part of what I am doing. Right back here, I can design space, I can create tensions. I can create qualitative conversations, right? And you know that I am designing space, but down there all, uh, I won't swear, but um, it all breaks loose, right? Anything can happen here. I could jump off the stage and you would all go like that because I broke a barrier, I broke a boundary. I, said, I broke a spatial <coughs> convention, right? And so our job is to use space as an emotional palette. All right. Okay. So one of the things that, that comes about from that use of space is the notion that proximity uh, mm. effect controls how strong the effect you have. So if you're sitting at the back of the stage, you are uh, exchanging maybe information, but you're not providing a sort of raw impact. Well, the same thing is true in physics, right? The, the, the strength of the, of the distortion depends on how close to the sun you are, for example. So that's why the planets that are close to the sun move much faster than the planets that are further away. Um, it's also a question about how those effects transmit themselves. So one of the things that I'm interested in studying is where dark matter is. And dark matter is one of these interesting things because its effect is only, as far as we know, as far as we can tell right now, gravitation. That means it doesn't affect things very far away from it very much. So the dark matter that I study is billions of light years away. We are not seeing the ripples from that dark matter. We need something that passes close to that dark matter and is affected by it. Luckily, we do have that thing because we have this distant backdrop of light, which is the distant galaxies. And the light from those galaxies does pass close to the dark matter and is therefore distorted. So I'm going to try to see if I can, if these slides show up. Yes. So in particular, this is a concept that, that again, Professor Alexander mentioned, that it's space and time are, are dynamical quantities. And so the sun does really bend and warp this geometry of space so that the light pass, that passes near the sun is actually distorted. And you see, for example, the stars behind the sun in different positions because of the bending of space. This is, after all, the experimental verification that Einstein's theory was correct. It was the experiment was done during a solar eclipse where you could actually see the stars behind it. But this bending has an extra effect if, you, if the object that's being bent isn't a point. Because in addition to bending, the images are distorted and bent into arcs. And so Professor Alexander showed you some arcs. I particularly love this picture from uh, on the right. This is a picture taken last year from a radio telescope hmm. where you can actually see the radio waves bending around the blue galaxy, which is an optical image, 
So the blue galaxy is emitting no radio waves at all. If you just look at the radio picture, all you would see is that red arc. Even without the presence of a galaxy in the middle, you know something is happening there. That information is transmitted, and that's the principle behind using this to measure the amount of dark matter. The bending tells you only how space is curved. It doesn't care whether it's dark matter or anything else that's doing the bending. And that means that I can weigh things at a distance using the fact that the light has come close and been affected, even though we ourselves aren't being pulled by that very distant dark matter. Um, I did want to also pick up on one other thing Professor Alexander pointed out in that, that Einstein did, which was to mix space and time. So we are all kind of used to this idea that our experiences through travel through space affect us. So you all literally took different paths to get to this room in your lives. You're not kind of used, to, not as used to the idea that you also took different paths through time to get to this room. But nevertheless, it is true. As Professor Alexander pointed out with his uh, symmetry of space-time, we all hurtle at the speed of light through space and time. The faster we move through space, the less we move through time, which means that all of us have actually aged a different amount to get here. We don't travel very, as a rule, most of us do travel very fast compared to the speed of light. So we didn't age that differently. But it is something that is true. And the bending of light also affects the path through space and time. And this has been most dramatically revealed. Let's see if I can try to get the laser pointer working. That's, yes. Um, about a year and a half ago, in these, the, uh, gravitationally lensed images where you see these very distorted galaxies, a star was observed to blow up. And because different paths of light get come to our eye because of the bending of space, the same star was observed multiple times to blow up. It gets better. <laughs> the paths aren't the same length. So we get to replay the movie and sure enough, this image was magnified a little bit more. It came a little bit earlier than this image. And the astronomers studying this realized that there was yet another object over here, which was um, an image of the same object. And sure enough, let's see, I think it's in this panel here. Um, a year later, the same supernova was observed to blow up again. You get to play the movie over again. You get to look into the past and into the future. Not your own, but somebody else's past and future. Mix playing with space and time in this way allows you to see how dynamical the stage really is and how much the universe really doesn't, isn't a static. It, it, it depends on the actions of things. I did want to... I also highlight that there is a, an aesthetic quality to the things I do. So one of the things that makes me thrilled about being an astrophysicist is you go to the telescope and you're literally the first person ever to see this part of the sky at this depth. And the patterns of distorted galaxies, and I have to say this, this, this screen with the lights on does not do justice to the complexity of these uh, patterns of ellipticities, you know, these arcs, these objects that appear multiple places that are really the same object, here's two of them that are the same, they have a, a beauty and a symmetry to them that, that is, I think, artistic. I did want to close with one sort of highlight. Let's see if this works. Uh, you might have to use the mouse to, to start it. Um, just to highlight the issue of do you need to see something? I've, I created this simulation about 10 years ago. Mm. This is an invisible object, only dark matter. It's passing in front of a screen of galaxies. The calculation is actually exact. It actually distorts the galaxies as you were. Um, and if you can play it again, you can see, you can play the spot the dark matter. And spotting dark matter turns out not to be hard at all. Now, I cheated. Uh, this is a very large lump of dark matter. And the time <laughs> it would take for us to actually observe this is much longer than the age of the universe. What we see is a snapshot at every point in time of this pattern, 
and not the full movie. But that movie is happening everywhere in space. So wherever we get those static pictures, the universe is you know, billions of years old and it takes billions of years to evolve. So those pictures are constantly shifting. As the matter in the universe clumps, moves around itself, distorts the space, makes other matter move, it's a play that's constantly evolving. And that is one of the things I find most fascinating. To you. Yeah. Well, we have about five minutes. Oh, that's great. It's okay. Worth opening for questions. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, and questions often. Yeah. Oh. No, it's fine. Oh, should, should we go to questions? Yeah, 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 yeah go to great. questions. What, is, what, what got. Um... Okay. Um, thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? I have, question? have the microphone. Please. So I'd like to ask <laughs> have the control. Yeah. You have well, one. So, first of all, I want to thank the panelists for this wonderful presentation. and especially our colleague uh, talking about dance. A few days ago, someone asked me, what is space? My first answer was, it's what dancers carve in. Yes. That's what space is. But my question is really for Jan. Jan, you know, you talked about dark matter, and a lot of us are very excited about that. But there's been this recent, uh, and I don't know how widely accepted, because I see you smiling, maybe you heard, there's been this recent uh, evidence that maybe we, dark matter isn't there. Would you comment about that? So, I, first I should point out that, that there's a paper almost every year that suggests that dark matter may or may not be there. I, the key aspect that, that I measure is the distortion of space. So there's an extra interpretive step that goes in from the distortion of space to its dark matter. Um, when I study the effect of the bending of light, the distortion of space, that's a measured quantity. And so I will tell you that the space is so distorted. Um, it's hard to actually get that amount of distortion in any other way without uh, violating or without changing how Einstein's relativity works. And so most of the models that have suggested that dark matter might not exist tend to ignore the strong gravitational lensing aspects and aren't really consistent with that. They match other observations. It's a situation where, where researchers who are looking into alternate models tend to lose the forest for the trees. And they'll go and chop one tree down, and then there are 150 other trees that say, no, the gravity really is this way. So at the moment, I'm not very impressed. But you know, if you can chop all 150 trees down, then maybe. Sorry, that was a bit of inside uh, discussion. Does anyone have a, any other questions? Me? Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I like the, con the connection you made with Miles Davis's notion of, you know, the, that the space exists between and how that, might, how that relates to dance. Um, are there particular, um, anyone that comes to mind in terms of dancers or choreographers where that has been explored actually? So many, um, because that's one of the premises of our training, or I'm, not everyone's trained the same, right? Um, my training has been um, in Mande, Mandakin dance, which is very uh, powerful, propulsive, um, from Mali um, uh, in Buto. Right now we're working with a master Buto artist where you're really, uh, you know, the, the two, between those two worlds, um, you're in high propulsion um, and then you are in so sustained in time, right? You go into flow states, meditative states, where it may take me a half an hour to move my hand from here to there. And then when it gets there, beyond my reach, I don't know how I got there, right? So you go between these deep, deep meditative, I'm gonna say stillness, stillness, still, right? You really are trained in, in more contemplative, okay, that's my background, in, in Buddhism and contemplative studies, contemplative dance. Um, you are so connected to every millisecond of 
activity that they're just like one stillness against another stillness. And we hear the space. We have to hear it. Um, we have to hear the stillness. And that's what I love about jazz, because it's just playing around with that. It is constantly saying, well, you didn't hear that. Did blah, blah, blah. Right? It's constantly asking us to hear the resonation around each accentuation, uh, each dynamic thrust. Um, and that's our training. But I'm, I, I wanted to give you a couple names. Um, Hofesh Schechter. Um, if you want to look his work up, um, I just saw him at BAM not too long ago. And musically, he's a composer and a choreographer. And I just went like this, right? The music was wonderful. But I wanted to feel what he was composing. Um, just the stillnesses. And I think Buto is one of the most profoundly um, conscious and unconscious spaces for that investigation. Um, yeah, I could give you a big list, um, but he's the one that's just blowing my mind right now. Um, he's an Israeli artist who is now at Sadler Wells in, in the UK. Yeah, okay. thanks for asking. With that, I would like to thank our panelists. All right, I learned something again. That's right.